Well, up until fairly recently in history, memory was thought of as a single mental entity, our ability to record experience, our ability to recollect and remember the past. But the, uh, I guess the big, the big insight, the central insight came around 1980 or so when we began to realize that memory is not a single faculty, that it's composed of multiple different abilities which are supported by different brain systems. And the major distinction that we draw is between our capacity for declarative conscious memory on the one hand and non-declarative, non-conscious, unconscious memory on the other hand. So it's not so mysterious because like when we say declarative memory or conscious memory, we simply mean the kind of memory that we, use when, that we mean when we use the word memory in everyday language, that you know, regular memory, remembering the past, remembering what we did yesterday, what we did this morning, what we did five years ago. But the, the, the important insight was that there are a whole variety of other ways in which experience can affect behavior, which in, that, in, which it's, in other words, experience-dependent behavior, which then deserves the term memory because it's experience-dependent, but where performance changes without requiring any conscious memory content, or even in many cases, the awareness that memory is being used. So here we're talking about things like skills and habits and simple forms of conditioning and other phenomena. There's a whole set of them. And each, each of these has a different brain substrate, a different, a different brain system that supports it. The initial insights about how to separate memory systems came from the discovery that patients who are profoundly amnesic, who, who on one sense seem to have no memory at all, that these patients are entirely normal at acquiring certain kinds of abilities, for example, motor skills. And when that discovery was first made, we all thought, well, motor skills is an exception, but everything else is regular memory. And then subsequent to that, it was discovered that, well, there's a whole, that was just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole variety of things that these patients can learn normally. And that includes habit, habits, cognitive skills, not just motor skills, perceptual skills, um, simple kinds of conditioning. And as those ideas came forward, each of them began to be studied in animals. And once it, we came to animals, then one could begin to do real biology and ask questions about what parts of the brain are doing it, what, what, you know, what, uh, how, how does it, how do the, how does it, how do these systems work, what are the principles governing each kind of memory, and so on.